Welcome back. This is segment one, when safe code isn't. So let's talk about safety. What exactly makes something safe? And who gets to decide whether something is safe? Well, as with most things, there's a lot of different perspectives on this. For a user, safety might mean that the code protects them against user error. For example, what we see a lot with the RC20 tokens is that users will send the tokens to the zero address or the token address itself. Um, obviously, this is not ideal for a user, and so user safety might mean that the token contract does not allow you to do that. For a programmer, safety might actually mean something completely different, namely protection against malicious input. For example, if a hacker is trying to steal tokens or duplicate tokens, a safe contract might not allow them to do that by having various safeguards. So clearly, there's the possibility for different people to have different definitions of what safety means. And when two people don't agree on the same definition, a lot of bad things can happen. One great example of this is the ERC-721, or the NFT standard. Of course, when it was first released, it wasn't called the NFT standard. Rather, they were called Ds. We can see in the earliest iteration of the spec, we had two functions. We had the approve function, which allowed some other user to uh, operate your deed. And then we had the take ownership function, which allowed you to take ownership of a deed only if you had already been approved for it. Of course, this doesn't look anything like the ERC-20 standard we're familiar with, or even the ERC-721 standard that we're now familiar with. And this is because after about a month, uh, the functions were renamed to better harmonize with ERC-20. So now we had the transfer function instead of the take ownership function, and we kept the approve function. However, this still wasn't quite like ERC-20 because the transfer function allows both the current deed owner as well as the approved deed controller to transfer. In essence, this was like the transfer and transfer from functions combined. And so a little while later, uh, we split them out, and so we ended up with both the transfer and transfer from functions as well as the approve function. At this point, the ERC-721 spec looked roughly similar to the ERC-20 spec, but there was going to be one more big change. That big change was the safe transfer functions. To understand what the safe transfer functions are, we can take a look at this first iteration of them. Here we have the unsafe transfer function, which behaves much like the current transfer functions. That is to say, the caller is responsible for confirming that the recipient is able to process the deed. Uh, if they're not, for example, if you type out the address or you sent it to the zero address, then the transfer would still succeed and nothing would happen. On the other hand, the transfer from function was now modified to check whether the recipient was able to accept the deed by calling a function on NFT received and expecting the magic return value of this uh, SHA-3 of ERC-721 on NFT received. So you can see how now the transfer from function is made safer because if a user tries to transfer it to a contract which wasn't expecting it, the transfer would fail. However, now we have a slight div uh, divergence from the ERC-20 spec where the transfer from function would only fail if you didn't have the correct balance or permissions. Now the transfer from function could also fail if the recipient wasn't expecting it. As a result, one more change was made to rename transfer from into safe transfer and unsafe transfer into transfer. This leaves us with the ERC-721 spec we're familiar with today, which includes the regular transfer from, which does not perform any validation, as well as safe transfer from, which performs the safe transfer. As I mentioned earlier, with the ERC-20 spec, a common mistake was to transfer tokens to the zero address or the token address itself. Uh, in other words, this wasn't exactly a solution in search of a problem. As a result, it wasn't surprising that future specs, such as the ERC-1155 specification, also included such safe transfer designs. So let's talk about safety. What do these safe transfers do? Well, in terms of user safety, they do a lot. They protect users from typos, and they protect users from sending tokens to the wrong address. However, in terms of programmer safety, it turns out these safe transfers are anything but, and in fact, introduce new security risks. To understand why, we need to take a look at unsafe external calls. Now, threat modeling is very important, and on the blockchain, the threat model is significantly different than, on, than in traditional programming. This is because with traditional programming, you typically assume that function calls are safe to make because you're either calling into your own code or a library that hopefully you trust that you've imported. On the other hand, on the blockchain, function calls are inherently unsafe because anyone can deploy to the blockchain, and when you call a function, you might be calling some untrusted code that an attacker has deployed.
And the reason that unsafe external calls are so unsafe in the first place is because during an external call, the attacker has full control over the control flow. What they can do is they can modify the global Ethereum state however they like, possibly in a way that you didn't anticipate because you didn't consider the possibility. One example would be to interact with your contract again, this is commonly known as free agency, or to interact with other contracts that you interact with. This is something that's often not considered. All of this is to say that basically any external call to non-trusted contracts may be unsafe unless you can verify that either the contract itself is trusted or the external call is safe. And so you might wonder, how exactly do we do that? Well, let's consider a hypothetical vulnerability. If this vulnerability is exploitable without needing the external call, then clearly the external call is redundant, and so it's not worth talking about. Therefore, if the vulnerability needs the external call, the external call must be contributing something to the exploit. And the only thing it can contribute is its vantage point in the middle of function execution. In other words, when the external call occurs, the function being executed has, has already checked or changed some state variables and then will proceed to check or change some state variables. And it's these state variables that you are able to manipulate in order to break the application in unexpected ways. To take a look at how a so-called safe transfer function might introduce unsafe behavior, I found two case studies for you. The first is the ENS name wrapper. This is an ERC-1155 token that's designed to wrap an ENS domain. And the purpose of this is to allow uh, ENS domain owners to have finer permission management over the domain. For example, uh, forbidding future subdomains from being minted or forbidding the resolver from being changed. If you'd like to follow, follow along or just like to take a look at the code for yourself, I provided the uh, GitHub repository as well as the relevant commit uh, in the slide. So feel free to take a look there. Uh, if you want to pause the video and come back later, that's totally cool. I'm going to assume that you're either back after pausing the video or you just want to see the solution. In any case, the first step to reviewing code is always to identify the business logic. In this case, if you'd opened up GitHub, you probably would have seen this directory listing. Right off the bat, we can eliminate a lot of files and folders as unimportant. For example, the mocks folder and the test folder are very obviously not relevant to a mainnet deploy. Additionally, the bytes util file probably isn't very interesting unless we wanted to really get into the nitty gritty because it's a library function. On the other hand, files like name wrapper sound very interesting because this is the name of the project and we can assume that there's going to be some interesting code in there. Additionally, ERC-1155 fuse sounds interesting because it sounds like a modification to the ERC-1155 standard and when people modify standards, they tend to break it in unexpected ways. Now that we've identified the business logic, it's time to figure out what the high-level user stories are. In this contract, there are a few. For example, a user wraps a domain and receives a token in return, or a user unwraps a token and gets a domain back, or a user owns a token and can modify the domain as they like. Now that we understand how the contract works, it's time to start checking for vulnerabilities. In this case, we know we're only focused on unsafe external calls, so let's start with that. Looking inside name wrapper, we can see some external calls being made. For example, here, 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 and here. However, these are not unsafe external calls because we can verify that the ENS contract is trusted and won't be doing anything suspicious. On the other hand, if we look inside the ERP ERC-1155 fuse file, we can see that, as expected, this file implements the ERC-1155 standard and explicitly makes an unsafe external call to the recipient of the token when it is minted. So now that we have an unsafe external call, the question is, is this call exploitable? Well, if we took a look at the wrap function, we can see that when we first enter wrap, we'll, we will immediately call underscore wrap, which we'll call underscore mint, and then once we've minted the token, we will receive the callback. And so the question is, What's been checked or changed since the start of the call? The answer is, well, we now have the token. And this token represents our ownership of the domain, which, interestingly enough, we haven't actually verified that we own the domain yet because this ownership check occurs after the mint. So now that we have token ownership, what can we do with it? Well, we can look for functions with the only token owner modifier. These include functions like unwrap, burning fuses, setting subnodes, or setting the resolver. And while all these are pretty impactful, the one most impactful is likely unwrapping. This is because unwrapping will transfer the underlying ENS domain back to us, uh, the owner of the token. And now that we have the ENS domain, we can do whatever we want with it. 
especially we can actually bypass the permission check from earlier right here because we now own the domain and so of course we're the rightful owners that uh, are allowed to mint the tokens for it. So we can see that through this safe transfer function, or I guess in this case, the safe mint function, we actually were able to exploit it and uh, obtain some very unsafe behavior. That is to say, the ability to take ownership of any domain that the ENS name wrapper was approved to modify. The second example is the Hashmasks NFT project. This is a limited supply NFT. Uh, there was a maximum of 16,384 of them to be minted, and anyone could mint them by purchasing them during the sale uh, with a limit of 20 per transaction. Again, if you'd like to follow along or simply look at this by yourself, the contract is given below, or if you don't want to type that out, just search for the Hashmasks token on Etherscan. So hopping right in, here's the mint NFT function. We can see that it makes some, it performs a few checks. For example, checking that the supply cap hasn't been reached, checking that the user is minting a correct number of NFTs, checking that the user won't exceed the supply cap after minting the NFTs, and checking that the user is paying the right amount of money. These are all correct checks to be made, and then afterwards, you can see that we just perform a very simple mint of all of the NFTs requested. So at first glance, this might seem to be completely safe code. However, knowing what we know, uh, we would want to check inside the safe mint function, and sure enough, there is an unsafe external call to the recipient of the token. Given that there's an unsafe external call, how might we exploit this contract? Well, suppose that we begin minting with 20 NFTs, and suppose that at the moment, there are only 20 more NFTs to be minted. In other words, once we mint these 20, the supply cap will be reached. Well, in this execution, the supply cap has not been reached, and we are minting a valid number of NFTs, and of course we'll be at the supply cap once we finish minting, and of course we'll have to pay the correct amount of ether. So all five checks pass. After minting the first NFT, we're going to receive a callback. During this callback, we can choose to mint another 19 NFTs. Notice that at the moment, we still haven't exceeded the supply cap yet because we've only minted one NFT. Furthermore, we are minting a valid number of NFTs, 19 is between 0 and 20, and Total supply, which is still, which is only uh, the previous total supply plus one plus nineteen, still won't exceed the supply cap, and of course we'll send the correct amount of ether, and so now we'll be able to mint another nineteen NFTs while the first batch of twenty still hasn't finished minting. After we finish minting the nineteen, we'll finish minting the remaining nineteen in the first batch of twenty. The end result is that we'll have minted an extra nineteen NFTs in this in this hash mask project, which is supposed to have a supply cap. As you can imagine, a project whose uh, selling point is there's a limited supply uh, probably won't like it too much that the supply cap is now being breached. So some key takeaways from this case study, uh, just because a function is called safe doesn't mean it's safe. And in general, don't assume what a function does. And in fact, even if you think you know what a function does, it might be worth checking it anyways, because in the worst case, you've wasted some time checking a function, and in the best case, you've prevented a catastrophic bug from affecting your project. Finally, keep in mind that any external call may be unsafe, unless you verify that either the contract being called is safe or that the call positioning itself is safe. And so, in general, always consider the positioning of the call and what you can do with that vantage point. That's it for segment one. In our next segment, we'll be talking about uncovering a four-year-old bug.